done? Is it is it documentaries like this to make raise the awareness to it? Yeah, I'm trying to raise the awareness. I'm trying to do what I can to help others. I hope that somebody invites me in to speak to children in school or or people that are incarcerated or what have you, or suicide groups, because I people need help and we can't deal with this by ourselves. Sometimes we think we can, but we can't. And I'm trying to make the awareness so it causes people to reach out, hopefully, for help. Because we can't keep suffering in silence with this because it's taking lives. People are afraid to talk about it because suicide has such a stigma to it. It's such a stigma and it's a religious connotation. You know, I've heard people say if somebody takes their life, they're gonna go to hell. And I just don't believe in that because if you believe in something that's bigger than you, a higher power, whatever you want to believe in, to me that entity should try to help you and should know that you can't handle these things by yourself. Because for myself, I need human contact. I need to talk to you. I need you to touch me. I need you to hold me. I can't do this by myself. And I've been at that door, Dan. I've been at that door where I was teetering. I could have failed this way or I could have failed that way. But I kept going because I found tools to help me through support groups, through talking to friends. My lovely husband, he's heard me over and over. He's watched my tears, you know, trying to get through things, trying to get through death. Not just my grandson's death, I lost my parents. I lost my only sister at 48. I grew up in a very religious background and I decided to leave 40 something years ago. I got ridiculed for doing that. All that got all down in my spirit. I thought I was on my way to this imaginary hell because I, I didn't attend a church. And it was just, you power on all of that stuff. Luckily, I didn't turn to drugs. I didn't turn to alcohol. I didn't turn to running in the streets, you know, or, you know, with having a husband. You know, I could have found solace in another man or something. I didn't choose to do that. I decided to deal with it through the tools that were given me, counseling. I still go to counseling. I mean, I think I gotta call my counselor today. They set up an appointment for me hopefully next week. Tell me about uh, the positives of AJ. Tell me about what a great kid he was. Uh, from the documentary, as a young boy, just a sweetheart and you stole your heart. Uh, and then and then as he got older, a lot of factors, external factors he had no control over got in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. He was a very happy child. I mean, I have some pictures here of him being a baby. He was the prettiest baby in the world to me because he was my first grandchild. And I watched him get born. And he was so pretty, he was, had a happy smile. Um, I've heard testimonials of friends when he was growing up as a teenager and into his adult life. He would give you the shirt off of his back. Now, he served, he got in some trouble with the law and he served three and a half years in prison. And I've even had inmates contact me and tell me that anything that he got, whether it was Raymond noodles or whatever that I would send him, he would break it off and divide it up, make it so it you know, so his friends in prison could have some more to eat because I guess he was always hungry in prison. So I would always send him a stipend to, so he could get extra stuff. And he would share this stuff. He had very little and he shared it. But it was like those that were around him and his family didn't understand him. They didn't understand his goodness. He found friends, you know, in the street when he was incarcerated. Those people seem to have understood him more. And he was the type of man that he wouldn't take anything from you. Very seldom. Now, he took it from me and his grandfather. But outside people, he didn't normally take. You know, people tried to help him. No, man, I'll get it myself. I'll do it myself. He would do those kinds of things. Was it the personal demons from his mother committing suicide that probably helped open that door that maybe that's a possibility for me and depression? Or what took him down that path? Well, even before his mother committed suicide, he grew up in a domestic violence home. He grew up in a home where there was alcohol and drugs, uh, the way I understand the story, through family members, that his mother's common law husband provided her with the drugs, okay? And he became that protector in the family. He watched his mother decline, 
And I guess he didn't like that, you know, her common law husband was providing the drugs. So, I mean, there were times when he would physically fight this man, like two men fighting in the street, trying to protect his mother. So he watched that growing up. He watched it. He watched it. And so when his mother took her life in 2004, it was just too much to bear. And I think it set a precedence or a blueprint for him because he never got that off of his mind because he grew up in foster care. And how does a 12-year-old child deal with suicide in foster care around people that really, really didn't love him like a family member would have loved him? They were just housing him. They were housing him. So, and they made money off of his body being in their homes. I mean, there was a, there was a couple foster care that had up to 12 to 16 children. How do you love 12 to 16 children? It's impossible. They needed attention. A lot of these kids had depression for whatever reason. Um, it's, it's one thing. A lot of families go through the pain that you guys have been through, but it's another thing to say, you know what? I want to do a documentary on that. How hard was it to get that documentary, both personally, emotionally, to get that documentary going, but to take that step of like actually making the phone calls and getting things going and selling a producer on, hey, I want to do this documentary, and it winds up on, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, in the very beginning, I wanted to rechannel my grief because I was really grieving. I was grieving. He was more like my son than my grandson because I basically took care of him. And so uh, I had the opportunity after he had taken his life, he took his life February the 18th, 2017. So a year later, I had the opportunity to visit Santa Rosa, Texas and San Antonio, Texas because I wanted to go to the place where he took his life. I wanted to go to the cemetery where some of his, and most of his ashes are buried. I have some. Uh, because I had talked back and forth with the monument company about his headstone, but I'd never seen it in person. So I wanted to go visit there. I wanted to go where he took his life. I wanted to touch the rails because he hung himself. And I wanted to walk that balcony and I wanted to touch those rails, you know, where he took his last breath. I wanted to be there in his essence. And I'm so glad I did because the elderly gentleman that tried to save his life, I knew that man had some guilt because he couldn't, he wasn't strong enough to cut the, the sheet. He tried. And uh, he tried to give him chest compressions to save his life. And I wanted to get that guilt burden off of him. And I wanted to meet that young man. And I didn't even have a phone number or anything. I just had an address. But as luck had it, he was home the day I went there. He didn't know I was coming. But how do you get a, how do you actually get the documentary made? I mean, who do you contact? How did that all happen? Because that's no easy thing in getting a whole crew to do that. Or I saw from the credit there's like one guy, maybe two people involved. But the, the getting the cameras to go uh, in Delta and Toledo at your home and down in San Rosa, Santa Rosa, and all these I mean, it was a very thorough documentary um, to get a crew on board to do something like that costs money. Mm -hmm. Oh, most definitely, it cost me a few dollars, and. Um, when I first went to Santa Rosa in San Antonio, Texas in uh, September of 2018, there was a young lady that I met because I was taking saxophone lessons and I asked my teacher, I said, do you know anybody that could help me? Because he had been profiled in the Toledo Blade with an article about his saxophone. This is a local guy? Uh-huh, local guy. Um, and so he said, I, I know a young lady that might be able to help you. So he gave me a name and I contacted this young lady and she was very receptive of taking a vacation for a week from her job and traveling with me. It was like, it was like something that I can explain, like doors that were opening for me that I can't explain. Everybody was on board and aligned to do this. So she traveled with me and four of my girlfriends in a van, we rented a van and we stopped along the way and uh, to some monuments and memorials and things going down through the South. And uh, she did some filming, she did some still shots, and that's how it got started. Now we put together, just her and I, a documentary, but when I watched it back, I knew that it wasn't a quality of Netflix, HBO, Showtime, Amazon, whatever. So um, I knew of a young man that was a film director. He has two or three films out. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and I contacted him. And uh, I told him about my film. 
And he said, can you ship that to me? And I did. And he took a look at the film. He says, I get your concept, a beautiful concept because it's needed right now in this society, but it's not of quality. But he says, I know of another film director that have helped me with my films. He'll be able to help you and get that to quality. So I sent, the, matter of fact, he sent the film to this young man that lives in New York. And uh, he got it together, which you see on Amazon Prime. It's like a one film producer shot. He did most of the shooting. He, uh, after I came back from San Antonio, Santa Rosa, Texas, he flew down there this year, May, May of 2019. He flew to those places and he interviewed all of the people that's in the documentary. He flew to New Orleans and he interviewed there. He flew to Toledo and he interviewed here. And I took him around to different places, out to Delta, uh, so that he could take shots in different places where Ajene, when he lived here for almost two years, where he frequented. So I took him to those places. As a matter of fact, we went to one of the homes that he lived in out in uh, Swanton, and there was a train so happened to be coming by, and he said, oh, I want to put that in the film. Just little things that he picked up. He took it to much better quality than I had done, because I'm not a professional. I did the best I could, but my, my goal was to tell the story about my grandson. And it's a lot of truths in that uh, documentary. And truth hurts, it hurts. You think I wanted to tell all that truth? But the documentary was about Ajene. And I tried to get everybody in that film to realize it wasn't about me, it wasn't about my husband, nobody that's in that film. It's not about any of us, it's about telling Ajene's story. And he's talking from the grave in order to help others that are struggling with this thing called life, depression, mental illness, addiction, he had it all. And I've been involved with the support group with my husband for 33 years. And I learned as being a family member of an addicted personality person, that there's three things that's gonna to happen to you when you're addicted to whatever you're addicted to. It's either you're gonna go crazy, which is mental illness, depression. You're gonna to go to prison, or you're gonna die those three things. My grandson, Ajene, experienced all three things. The finale was death. The finale was death. And he struggled a long time. He tried to make it on his own. He got jobs here, there, and everywhere because he knew if he didn't work, he didn't eat. Coming out of the prison system, you're a felon. So how do you get the better jobs being a felon unless somebody gives you a hand up? And he really didn't have that. He was trying to do it on his own. He was trying, because I used to always tell him, AJ, I can see you coming out of prison, baby. I can see you on somebody's stage, and your grandmother will be on the front row cheering you on because you will be able to help others. Did you talk to him much at all? Oh, I talked to him probably every week. Up, up to when he killed himself? Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I, talked, I called him 10 days before he took his life, and we played phone tag. So I never got a chance to really talk to him, but he left a message on my answer machine which I still have to this day. It seemed from his selfie video that, that they opened the, the film with, he was a very troubled young man. Very, very angry. Yeah, wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be yeah. going through that as a youngster yeah. with watching what your mother did, what her common law husband did, and then your mother taking her life and you have nowhere to turn, nobody in the family has taken you. He had four other siblings. All yeah. those siblings were taken by a family member. He's the only one that went into foster care. I know I would be angry. He became a cutter, where teenagers cut their yeah, arms. They're trying to cut the pain out. Yeah. Um, it, it was just too much for him to bear. I, I don't think I could have bared it. I don't think I could have. Regrets? Um, yes, but I'm working on those regrets. I'm much better than I was two and a half years ago. One of my biggest regrets in 2004, when his mother took her life, um, me and my husband had just moved into a retirement community. We had a villa built. And after his mother took her life, I went back and forth with my husband. We need to take him. Now, the rules don't say that you can't have ch children living with you, but being that most people there were empty nesters, my neighbors on both sides of me across the street, I didn't want to bring a teenager because I would, my neighbors would be looking at me like, 
we moved here to have peace and quiet and no bumping radios and thumping and teenagers coming into. So I didn't want to do that to my neighbors because I wouldn't have liked to have had somebody next door to me moved yeah. in a teenager. And now these teenagers is hanging around. I'm looking at them like, oh, goodness, what they going to do? Whatever. Yeah. So I didn't do it. And I went back and forth with it, back and forth with my husband. I would be crying like, oh, we got to do something. We got to take this baby. That's hard. I didn't do it. So that was my regret because I felt as though after he passed, had me and my husband taken him, maybe we could have nurtured him and given him love, but we would have been taking a handful because at that point, he had experienced a lot of things in his home. And it probably, I don't know, you can second guess yourself. I don't know how it would have come between me and my husband's relationship. I, don't, I just don't know. You know, you had them woulda, shoulda, coulda, we, we, we can't live our lives uh, second guessing decisions yes. we make. You make decisions based on your, 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 your spouse, um, your family situation, financial. I mean, if you knew that was going to happen, but, but we don't know that. That's how we live life. We just take it day by day and, and just try to keep your head above water. Right, because that was like 13 years you know, prior to him taking his life. And I didn't know how that was going to turn out. But, you know, of course, he after... He was 25? He was 25 when he took yeah. his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he struggled. He was 12 when her, his mother took her life. So he struggled 13 years yeah. trying to rise above that. He kept trying to rise above it. One day, I would, I would always go on his Facebook page and see what his attitude was. Yeah. Some days he was up, oh, this is a good day. I'm getting a job. And... And then maybe two days later, oh, I'm feeling terrible. I, I don't want to live no more. Uh, and one Sounds, he also maybe had some, some mental illness in that it was like. Yes, that's what it was. was a, yeah. That was what it was, a yeah. roller coaster. We're down at the interview. Um, I'd like to get some shots of us flipping through the, the photo album. Uh, you want her to come around this way for yeah. the lighting or? Yep. Yeah. Just come on this way here and just, just flip me through here. I thought that the uh, the uh, the person who produced the movie, the, the director, just r telling the story mm -hmm. because I don't know how it's going to turn out. I, I know just from what I heard from you, but but telling the whole story, like yeah, he was born and he beautiful baby, blah blah blah, and the, and the film, the you know the, the snapshots and your son talking, and mm -hmm. yeah, it was uh, mm -hmm. it was very very touching. This is prior to him leaving, going to uh, San and Santa Rosa with his mother. Yeah. He was like 14 months when he left. Okay, 14 months mm -hmm. when he left town. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, prior to him leaving. Okay. He played some baseball. Mm -hmm. He played baseball. He played football. He wanted to be a professional football player, but he Don't started. See, so yeah, he started having problems with his knee. This is him learning how to write. This is the first house that he went to when he moved to Santa Rosa. Just a little small, simple house. Yeah. All the problems started there. Boy. Report cards. His mother would send me report cards. Oh, what a beautiful smile. And he, and he, see, he was such a happy baby. Yeah. But that countenance changed once his mother, you know, took her life. Happy. So innocent. And I used to send him affirmation letter. I think I sent this to him when he was 15 letting him know he was very good looking, uh, excellent reader, just all these affirmations that I would send him. Did he call you grandma? Mm-hmm, grandma. My wife insists on Grammy. Oh, really? Now, I have my other grandchildren, they call me Nana, but he called me, um, this was the day he left going to, uh, back home to Texas. And these are some of him as an adult. Yeah. Continence is never like a smile, yeah. except that one is, has a smile. These are all of his pictures. He would always keep his hair so groomed. He was a handsome young man to me. Pretty baby, a handsome young man. And here's a t-shirt that he got that my husband really likes that um, depicts only God can judge me. I always thought he had a premonition. It was something that I felt. This was the young lady that was with him that night. She watched it all. Mm -hmm. Tried to stop it. This was the day of his mother's funeral. All the five children. That's him. And that's him. Oldest. Everybody got taken except him. And you've seen the documentary talks about some of the racism in the family. Mm -hmm. And this was a month before he passed. 
Hispanic and African American became the most volatile. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He met uh, Mayor Jack Ford when he lived in you need you want to get well, I was gonna um, I was gonna ask if I could like just get some slope like with some other like, pictures you want just the, me like can you the child me? pictures or the I'll, I'll just do a couple okay dang can you what he wants what more time do you put the page for you if you want I was gonna like so man with some pictures there and I sent you some pictures too yeah mm -hmm. and she has those and she's making her own work This is going to be a, about a minute, 30, minute, 45 news story, so we have to really condense and take out some information. It won't, okay. be, it won't be a real thorough story, unfortunately. It won't be a, a, a very long story. Which I, was, I was trying to get on this program that you guys called with Jerry Anderson, Leading yeah. Edge, yeah. and I have contacted him two or three times to no avail. I don't I'll know. Talk to him. Could you? Because maybe he can do a more in depth. Yeah. Jerry. Jerry tends to uh, go toward more politics with his, his shows. Oh, really? He gets like city council people and talking state representatives and Marcy Captor and a whole variety of stuff, but um, I'll talk to him. Okay, even that young Jalen Jefferson. <laughs> I would love for him to interview me. That would be a good story for him. You want it to? Yes. All right, um, I don't, I, I'm sure we can get his information. And do you have Oprah's number? No, I do not. <laughs> I do not. Sorry, Queen. Do you have Gail King's number? I do not. Um, so I was we're out on the street at Race for the Cure. It was about ten minutes before the race starts. Right there in Summit Street was our position, and and he's in there, you know, getting shots of us. Like, Jade, what are you doing, man? So we got a hug, and I had to get a selfie with him. And I I put on Twitter like, here's a picture of uh, uh, one very famous person, one who's not. Yeah. <laughs> Because you know he was interviewed by Ellen and Oprah, and I would yeah. love to. I'm trying to. I, I write these people, but I don't think I have the right contact with you know, Ellen or him. Oprah. I asked him because I mean he just looks to me like he'd be right for bullying in school. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, he's a big deal outside, but in school, like, what's it like in the restroom with the mm -hmm. guys and stuff? And I remember when I was in, in elementary school, you know, at the urinal, and somebody came in and like ram a knuckle in my back, mm. flip the lights out, and Gah! Like, mm. but uh, he said no. He said actually, uh, things now, now that he's a big, yeah, 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 yeah he's things a star. are everybody who wouldn't give me time of day is like, hey, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, how yeah, you yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's got all kinds of friends. <laughs> That's how it goes because you know how people like to rub against up next to somebody that they feel is a star. They think it's gonna rub off on them. That's your mind. If I can get your microphone. You want more? I'm gonna give you a hug. Oh, thank you for coming down and contacting me. I really enjoyed this. I just, I just love the documentary. Where, where'd you put the mic? Down in the pocket. Get down. That's in her. I've just really enjoyed the whole. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I know. I, I, again, you. it's, it's a very painful. It's a very raw thing for you, but it's important. Mm -hmm. And I think you recognize that, and so mm -hmm. does Dennis. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like. Uh, it's, it, I'm getting a lot of positive feedback about it. I have so many people contacting me privately. Matter of fact, last week I was talking to a girl off the ledge. She contacted me privately, and I tried to help her the best way I could, trying to let her, you know, hang on, baby, because what you're going through is just temporary. My wife says it's a, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yes, there you, you know, go. Like, life can really suck sometimes mm -hmm. but hang in there and there's always tomorrow and there's always tomorrow you get a second chance it's called tomorrow and there's always vodka <laughs> yes <laughs> anyway this was the queen cookie down at uh, dan cummins spot on channel 11 uh this is supposed to run tonight dan the minute or six two six o'clock tonight yeah six p.m for all you folks that watch channel 11 okay uh dan cummins interviewed my beautiful bride queen cookie mac belcher Oh, isn't that wonderful? Okay. I'll tell you what. Great job, Dan. Great job, Queen Thank Cookie. You. And All you here, folks out there in Facebook you know. land, this, uh, this yeah. is uh, the Queen doing her thing, as you yeah. guys know. Uh, remember, the Ajene Burt story actually is called A Cry for Help. The Ajene 
expert story. It's raw. It's controversial. It's real. Some people love it. Some people don't love it. But you know what? You take from it what you want. Leave the rest. This is D.B. Belcher, Queen Cookie's uh, husband, saying, uh, as we always say to you folks out there. And that's what you can. Yes, dear. We love ourselves, so, but we also we'll love, love y'all to life. Each Peace. and every one of you, be kind to each other out there. We're gone. D.B. Belcher out. Go Bucks. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. Absolutely. He always got to get them Absolutely. bucks in every broadcast that I do. But I still love him. Michigan, I got my <laughs> eyes on you. <laughs> Bye, y'all.